You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello and welcome back to the Inside China podcast. My name is Holly Chick, talking to you from the studios of the South China Morning Post here in Hong Kong, where we are celebrating the end of two and a half years of mandatory mask wearing outside. On the streets of Hong Kong, we're getting used to seeing each other's faces again. And on the streets of Beijing, there's a huge amount of activity and preparations for the two biggest political meetings of the year. And there's a lot to talk about. It is one year since the Russian army invaded Ukraine. It is one week since Beijing issued a 12-point peace plan to end that war. It's just over two months since Beijing ended its zero-COVID policy. It's been six weeks since China announced its population had declined for the first time since 1961. These meetings are going to influence the shape and direction of the policies and people in China's central government, as well as China's government institutions, for the years to come. This week, you're going to hear analysis on exactly how that's going to play out from one of my colleagues on the China desk here. But first, let me recap for you some of the details about the two sessions and how it works. More than 5,000 delegates will be attending something we know informally as the two sessions. In Chinese, it's called Lianghui. Officially, it's got a much longer name. The first meeting is for the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the CPPCC. The other one is for the National People's Congress, the NPC. If you've grown up, with Western democracy models, the CPPCC is more like the upper house of parliament or the Congress, except it's made up of just over 2,000 representatives from political parties, social groups, professions, as well as prominent entertainers, athletes, religious leaders, and academics. This is where you tend to see appearances from people like Jackie Chan and Yao Ming, its role is to advise the government on policies, and its various committees submit proposals on everything from economics to religion, sports, health, and foreign affairs. The NPC is more like the House of Representatives or the House of Commons, except it's much larger than its US or UK counterparts. It's where nearly 3,000 delegates who are chosen from the provinces autonomous regions, and municipalities controlled by China's central government, as well as the special administrative regions of Macau and Hong Kong. The NPC meets just once in a year in the Great Hall of the People, and its agenda is set months in advance. The entire event is highly choreographed and managed. But it's also one of the very few times the foreign media, and yes, that includes us at the South China Morning Post, gets to pose questions directly to top government officials. And you can probably guess that some of us will be asking about Ukraine, Taiwan, China's birth rate, and of course, the plans for the Chinese economy. The two sessions are watched closely because it's an important way for the Beijing central government to tell the 1.4 billion people of China, as well as the rest of the world, just what its priorities and plans are for the year to come. This year's two sessions will see China complete a twice a decade leadership transition with a reshuffle of top government jobs. And that's on top of all the other issues the Beijing central government is facing right now. William Zheng is a senior correspondent with the China Desk here at the South China Morning Post, and he has been doing a lot of reporting on the staff and policy changes that are expected at this coming two sessions. Hi, William. Hi, Holly. William, last year the two sessions was overshadowed by three major stories. The first one being Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The second one being the economic hardships brought on by China's harsh zero COVID controls. And the third one was Xi Jinping's desire for an historic third term as China's leader. 
This year, the war is still going on. China's peace plan to end it has been rejected by Russia, and the economy is still struggling to recover. And just over a month ago, we had news that China's population was shrinking for the first time since the famine of the Great Leap Forward years in the 1960s. It sounds like there's a lot to talk about at this year's two session. Yeah, indeed, you are so right by pointing out that the first two concerns still lingers around. The Ukraine war is still ongoing, and the economy hardship now became the most important task in front of Xi Jinping and his new team to manage. And uh, more importantly, this year we are seeing that there is a continuation. Of the power succession in China, where after President Xi has、uh, secured his third term in the 20th Party Congress in October, now the two sections is a last step of the whole political cycle, where we will see the whole installation of new premier, vice premier, state councillor, all the various ministries if there are still vacancies. More importantly, Beijing also put forth a major reform plan for the party and state organs, which is kept as a top secret until now.、Uh, no official media has given、uh, any details on it, but there has been a lot of speculations. So this Liang Hui, as how China calls it, the two sessions, will be seeing the debut session of many of the Chinese politicians. Where we know that they have already got their party capacity, for example, the the new Politburo members and all this. But we are yet to see that what are the state function. Some of them will be assigned to, and、uh, some of the key people that we will definitely be looking at would be Mr. Li Qiang, who is most likely to become the next premier. During the wrap up of the two section, that will be his、uh, first time. He will be hosting hundreds of、uh, local and foreign press members, and that would be the first opportunity for the member of the press to ask questions to him directly. That would be a very interesting occasion that we will be able to assess what's his personal style and how is he different from his predecessor Li Keqiang. Oh,、uh, by the way, interestingly, Li Keqiang will be delivering the government work report for the last time. Then, during the presser, it will be a new premier coming in. William, it's interesting that you mentioned the press conference with、uh, the new premier Li Qiang. And another interesting aspect of this year's two session is that it's going to be the first time in two years that foreign media will be allowed to attend, and it will be the first chance for foreign media to ask questions directly to China's new foreign minister, Qin Gang. Why is that important? It would be very interesting to get the first-hand response from China's new foreign minister about the latest development in Russia-Ukraine war. That has been the top concern, and、uh, now everybody is talking about China's peace plan for Ukraine, and lots of diplomatic activity has been conducted. We see Wang Yi, that is Qin Gang's boss, fly to Moscow recently. And Belarus、uh, country leader also had a visit to China, so with all these activities, I think the Western world must be very interested to know that what are the things that China going to do to facilitate a peace deal in seemingly difficult situation in Russia and Ukraine. That would be one of the top concern. I would believe our fellow journalists in Beijing would definitely want to ask him about China's.、Uh, Diplomatic approach will the wolf warrior style continue, or there has been a subtle change? And how would the Belt and Road continue? Those are China's key diplomatic efforts, and I would believe that Taiwan would definitely come up as one of the very major topic. Where we have been hearing rumors about Taiwanese leader Tsai Ing-wen's、uh, potential U.S. visit. And、uh, people has been asking、uh, Kelvin McCarthy about his potential Taiwan visit also. So it will be a very interesting、uh, occasion to ask、uh, Minister Qin Gang about all these issues and、uh, get him to either reiterate China's、uh, position. And there is always a story, right? Even if he reiterated China's position, and、uh, the next morning we can say that China's position did not change. All 
all there is a slightest change, I think the world's media will will be putting his press conference under magnifying glass to find the slightest nuance what from what he said. One of the biggest priorities for Beijing is getting China's economy back on track after the past two years of zero COVID restrictions. William, can you tell us about any major changes coming to the people overseeing the finance sector? Let's put it together. When we talk about finance, we can't uh, talk about it alone. We need to look at the whole economic team. A key point in these two sections would be the installation of new economic management team. Especially while a lot of Western world observers are looking at China's financial sector. But overall, at the top of this team, there would be the new Premier Li Qiang, who used to be President Xi's uh, top personal aide and uh, top policy advisor when uh, Xi is in Zhejiang. And Mr. Ding Xuexiang, who is uh, ranked number six of the Politburo Standing Committee, he is also President Xi's very close personal aide in Shanghai. He is tipped to be the executive vice premier, taking over from his predecessor Han Zheng. So with these two Politburo Standing Committee members in, we will likely be seeing a few other Politburo members like uh, He Lifeng, Liu Guozhong and uh, Zhang Guoqing would take up the vice premier role. And many people talk about He Lifeng because He is also President Xi's very trusted personal aide when President Xi was serving in Xiamen. Also, there have been words circulating on the market saying that besides the vice premiership, he will also become the party secretary of China's central bank. If this is realized, this is unprecedented. It would show that uh, President Xi's trust in him to manage China's huge finance sector, which is brought in many problems like bad debts that's piling up and uh, local government are having all this trouble of uh, refinancing itself, uh, facing a major slowdown of the property sector. And President Xi also mentioned many times about China's financial security. So this whole task would be managed by He Lifeng, most likely. While Liu Guozhong and Zhang Guoqing, they will split the rest of the state council's portfolios. And below them, there will be a layer of uh, state councillors. Some of the names that has been floated to us would be like Shen Yiqing, who will be the top female government executive now. Many people speculated that she might take over from Sun Chunlan's role on the health education and all this. And uh, Wu Zhenglong, former Jiangsu's party secretary, would be the new secretary general for the whole state council. Of course, we have talked about Qing Gang. Usually, the foreign minister would be state councillor, and the new defense minister will also take up the fourth seat. Many people say that uh, the senior general in rocket army, Li Shangfu, would most likely to take up this role according to his standing in Central Military Commission. You just mentioned the new defense minister. William, can you tell us more about him and the rocket army that he is overseeing? And obviously, a big priority for Beijing has been its defense budget and its military development. Just tell us more about this. It's actually very interesting personality in China. Uh, Li Shangfu has been uh, previously very secretive because he is in charge of the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. Lots of satellites are launched from Xichang under Li Shangfu's care. And more interestingly, he is sanctioned by the U.S. So it would be really very interesting to see if Li Shangfu indeed became the new Chinese defense minister, how is U.S. going to resolve these uh, sanction problems? Would you want to talk to a sanction guy or, or you lift the sanction quietly? How will the U.S. Army and the PLA continue or at least uh, try to form their dialogues and like what Blinken said, forge the guardrails to avoid the two great powers getting into military conflicts. So Li Shangfu would be one of the very key person. He is a rocket scientist. He knows inside out of China's space program. And as we all know, China's space program is tied 
to its missile programs. Basically, that really depends on how you configure your rockets, right? If you shoot it upwards into the orbit, that's manned space program. But if you take aim at uh, the other land target, that would be a ICBM, right? So roughly, that's the whole idea. But I would say making him top military man would show a very clear indication of how Beijing wanted to upgrade its new military capabilities based on science and technology and based on space. It will be a very interesting decade that we can look for. Will there be a star war between China and US? We don't know, but China's most likely candidate for the defense minister would be a very interesting person to look at. And this will be also a first time that he can debut in front of Chinese media and we can watch what he said and how he carried himself. Would there be a slight difference between him and General Wei Fenghe? So all these will be very interesting observations for the military observers also. Well, now defense is one thing, but what about changes to security and how Beijing polices its own citizens? What can you tell us about this portfolio? Basically, this is the whole part of the restructuring plan of party and the state organs, which was uh, already approved in principle during the second plenum on Tuesday. So Xinhua News Agency has already given the read-up saying that there is such a plan and it has been approved by the party central committee but without without giving any details. However, the murmuring among the political observers are, number one, it will focus on the security apparatus, the financial industry, and some other functional agencies, including Hong Kong Macau offices. Well, all these are rumors, but it does tie into what President Xi Jinping has said about this restructuring reform. People have been speculating that there could be a plan for China to put all its Ministry of Public Security and the Ministry of State Security together. Ministry of Public Security is China's police arm. Ministry of State Security is China's spying and anti-spy agency. So obviously, there has been many talks about how to better manage these two together. Traditionally, it's been put under the Commission of Political and Legal Affairs under Mr. Chen Wenqing. However, many observers have been saying that China would probably want to scale up the whole structure to have a comprehensive security structure, national structure, so that it can put everything into one umbrella some people has been comparing it to former USSR's Ministry of Internal Affairs or whatever, but we don't know. We do not know the details, but that's some of the talks on the market. And of course, William, there would always be focus on mentions of Beijing's oversight of Hong Kong and the policy known as one country, two systems. Are there any changes you see ahead there? There would definitely be major changes to Beijing's Hong Kong-Macau systems. First of all, Vice Premier Han Zheng is going to step down. He has been the leader of the party's uh, Hong Kong-Macau affairs leading group, what a mouthful word, uh, for past five years. He has already stepped down from the party's central committee, so it's very unlikely that he will continue to lead that party group. And like what I have uh, published a story today, many of the observers are, are saying that either Ding Xuexiang or Wang Huning will be able to take over this portfolio. So that's the top party leadership on Hong Kong and Macau matters. Then it comes to the apparatus, the arms and legs that executes the party's decision. The Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office is likely going to be elevated this round. In Chinese, we call it 一个机构,两块牌子. One institution, but carry two names. Previously, why the HKMAO itself only carries state council name? Because since the handover, Beijing has tried very hard to play down the party role in Hong Kong. Basically, the party goes behind the stage and the state council 
will front the role, so that it forms a central government and uh, the SAR government kind of relationship, while the party does not appear in the management of Hong Kong. But you can see that after 2019's social turmoil, and also President Xi Jinping came to power since 2012, he had been stressing about party's strength and the party's control. Uh, he won party to basically quote him, Dong Xi Nan Beijong Dang Ling Dao Yi right? Party leads everything. So that includes Hong Kong affairs, right? So it should not be very surprising that on the party side, the HKMAO will carry a title called the Hong Kong Macau Affairs of the Central Committee of the CCP. And at the same time, it still carries the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office of the State Council. It shows that the party is no longer shy about its role in Hong Kong and Macau Affairs. And it's also never shy to show that its uh, status in Taiwan Affairs because since 1993, Beijing has been very careful about its relationship with Taipei. So a lot of Beijing's communication or Beijing's interaction with Taipei is done party to party. And Beijing used its uh, CPPCC network to work with Taiwan instead of any government issues because there are sovereignty issues related. Beijing has, is extremely careful not to give people any way that can attack them saying that, oh, now Beijing has changed its Taiwan stance and, and all that. So Taiwan affairs has always been party plus state council. But Hong Kong-wise, at the first two decades of the handover, Beijing has been trying very hard to allow the Hong Kongers to manage Hong Kong. So the party actually stepped aside. You don't quite see any party words or party logos here. And I heard they don't even want to have their party meetings here. They are very careful not to let the Hong Kongers felt the party's presence. But now it's a totally different thing. Let's see what will this structural change bring further changes to Beijing's uh, handling of Hong Kong. That would be one of the most important things that we should follow up in these uh, two sessions. William, there's a lot to think about and a lot to talk about after the two sessions. Thank you very much. Yeah, there will be a lot to write about. Uh, do log on to SEMP to read our live blogs and on-site reporting and uh, deep analysis about the two sections. So keep your eyes peeled. As you heard from William, the team from the China Desk here at the South China Morning Post are working hard to bring you the latest news and best analysis from Beijing and the two sessions. Keep up to date with our work on scmp.com. And if Twitter is still working by the time you hear my voice, follow us at SCMP News. Thanks for listening. And a quick reminder, if you listen to this podcast on iTunes, please give us a review and help us get noticed by more people. My name is Holly Chick. Bye for now.